Welcome to today's edition of the Rush 24-7 Podcast. Trump did not suffer a congressional loss last night. The media doesn't get this. Do you understand what happened here, Snurdly? The media, they're so eager to report that Trump's losing the support of his voters that they are totally missing what this Alabama thing is all about. In essence, Trump's voters were protecting him. And I, I'm, I'm fully prepared to explain this. Greetings, my friends. It's great to have you here. We have three hours of broadcast excellence, 800-282-2882. If you want to appear on the program, if you want to send an email address, the uh, address is elrushbo at eibnet.us. Now, i got to come clean about something here. I've had people pest. Pestering is the wrong word. I have had people in the email asking me for the past number of weeks, why aren't you talking about Alabama? Why aren't you weighing in? This is very important. I only use a voice like that to distinguish it from my own. I'm not trying to suggest that people complaining to me sound dumb. I just Or any other way. I'm just trying to distinguish... Uh, the voice of those who are speaking to me from me. And there's a reason, folks. Um, I did not say a word about this because I did not... I, I wanted to get a clean result of this. I didn't want anybody to be able to say that what happened was because I urged people to do one thing or the other. You know as well as I do that the drive-bys are eager to attach your motivations and, and your actions to my suggestions. Now, I know there were all kinds of other people out there advocating for one candidate or another, and that's fine. But I, I purposely didn't, almost as an experiment here, um, because in my mind, I wanted... What, what I view, anyway, is a clean result. Now, it's obvious, and I'm not an idiot, that a clean result may not be actually ascertainable here because there were a lot of other people on radio and TV who were advocating one way or the other in this race, predominantly one way. But at least for me, I can come here today and tell you that whatever happened had nothing to do with anything specific I said. I mean, I realize, folks, I'm a powerful, influential member of the media, and whatever these results are, I didn't want any of it, not tainted, but affected by any suggestion that voters in Alabama were not exercising their own decisions. Because you know how the media treats talk radio and conservative media, the audience, a bunch of mind-numb robots, doesn't know anything, and they only do what people on radio and TV tell them to do. So I stayed out of this. I also knew what was going to happen. I knew why Trump endorsed the loser. I know why Trump endorsed the loser from the get-go. I did tell you that. He endorsed the loser because at the time it happened, he was trying to buy appeasement with Mitch. Trump, frustrated, can't get his agenda done in Washington, thought he would try appeasing Mitch McConnell. I knew it wasn't going to work. But what the drive-bys are missing here is the voters of Alabama knew exactly what was at stake here, and the voters of Alabama sent essentially an insider packing. And with this insider, a bunch of others may go. Corker has announced he's leaving. And before today, before last night, a number of other uh, uh, insider establishment senators were alluding to the fact that if uh, the, the result came out as it did, they would be leaving. And I, we talked about this on the program. Isn't it amazing that rather than adapt and accommodate the mood of voters in their own party, they actually talk about retiring, thinking the place is no longer a good place for them, the Senate. Their, their attitude is, man, if the voters have gotten this far out, if the voters are this way, i got no prayer, I'm out of here. Rather than easily adapt, it wouldn't be that hard to adapt. You repeal Obamacare, you cut taxes, and you build a wall, and you stop immigration. It's not that hard. But they can't.
for some reason seem to do it. This tax cut plan is another thing that is uh, a disaster. It is an absolute disaster in more ways than it is not. We'll get into that here in uh, in just a moment. Judge Moore, the media think they have something to crow over here. A candidate that Trump supported has been defeated in a primary. I also never endorse in primaries, by the way. But anyway, a candidate uh, has been defeated in a primary. Never mind the candidate who beat Trump's pick is more of a Trumpster than Trump's pick was. And that's always been the case. The voters were consistent here. The voters did not. They're all saying that Trump has no coattails. They're all saying that Trump's influence is over. No, 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 no. What it means is, folks, that Trumpism is bigger than Trump. It is kind of a... You know, maybe a pink flag for Trump, but I, I don't think it's that big a deal. It's it, it maybe a bit of a warning, but it's very clear what happened here. The voters of Alabama and the voters of this country, the people that take the time to vote are well aware. They have studied and they're fed up and it's not changing. And they're very dissatisfied that even after a smashing victory like was had last November, the results are not yet seen nearly to the degree people hope and expect. And so a Trumpist was added to the arsenal in the United States Senate. I don't know how the, the, the media is just, the media is, is grasping at straws. They're so caught up in what they want to happen that when they think it does, they run with it and they're making fools of themselves here. Because the people in Alabama, if you want to really break this down, they saw Trump endorse the wrong guy. I don't know if they knew why Trump did it. I don't know if they uh, were in open defiance of Trump. And again, the voters of Alabama realized that Donald Trump needed somebody else. They are invested in Trump. They're invested even more so in Trumpism. Without Trump right now, there isn't any Trumpism. This is this vote had nothing to do with Trump's endorsement. This vote had everything to do with the voters of Alabama realizing what is necessary to give Donald Trump the tools that he needs in the House and in the Senate to move his agenda forward. This, as That's why I say this vote was almost the voters of Alabama circling the wagons to protect Trump. Had they accepted his endorsement and, and uh, gone ahead and, and elected Luther Strange, uh, the odds are it would have been a setback for the Trumpism movement, and the Trumpism movement didn't want a setback. This isn't complicated, but you have to have an open mind to see it this way. And the media doesn't. The media is reveling here in the fact that Trump's voters ignored him. And they think they're on the cusp now of being able to separate all of you Trump voters from Trump. And if they can do that, it's mission accomplished. But they're not even close. If the media had any sense, this result would depress them. If the media had any sense, this vote would shock them like a cold shower. Ice cold water coming out of the shower head is how this result should affect them. But folks, they're not there. They are, they are so guided, blinded by their own bigotry and prejudice. They are so eager to see what they hope to happen actually happen that when it doesn't happen, they think it has happened. Now, you ought to see it. I mean, they're all having a party today over at CNN. They think it's the beginning of the end of Trump. Wait a minute. Hold everything. How's it the end of Trump when another Trumpist has been sent to the Senate and a non-never-Trumper is leaving? I.e. Corker. And there might be even more. As I guarantee you this. The establishment senators, I mentioned this, establishment senators before this race looked at it and they said, oh, my God, if this guy, Roy Moore, this is the Ten Commandments guy. If this guy wins, oh, my, I got to get out of here, said some of these establishment senators. This is no longer going to be a home for me. As I say, rather than adapt and rather than accept the mood and desires of voters in America... They want to get out. Wait, well, that's fine. That's 
the way the cookie crumbles. The uh, the drive-bys, the social media, are saying uh, the same things about Roy Moore that they said about Trump when he was elected, which is another good sign. They still don't get it. I don't think, folks, to be honest with you, I don't think they're capable of uh, of getting it. I, I think they're poisoned. Their political brains are poisoned. It's been self-poisoned. They simply cannot see what is. Their ability to analyze uh, openly, even accommodating their biases, has been lost. But I don't know. To me, this is rather simple. How do you consider it a loss when an ardent Trumpist has been elected to the United States Senate? Well, because, Rush, because Trump endorsed the other guy. Yeah, see, that's the way the drive-bys think. And they think newspaper endorsements matter, too. They think, you see, they think you Trump voters, you're my number of too, just like listeners to this program. Whatever Trump says, you'll do it. Whatever Trump wants, you'll provide it. Whatever Trump's mad at, you'll be mad at. Whatever Trump thinks, you'll think. You have not got minds of your own. So in their world... You split from Trump last night. They cannot see that you had Trump's back last night. No more complicated than that. I'd be willing to accept your thoughts on this, but uh, you know, I, I, it, it, to me, it's patently obvious what happened here. The uh, Just like with Trump, by the way, the, the editors, the other pundits out there are assuring us that this spells doom for the Republican Party. They, they, they never say that about a, a winning Democrat candidate, no matter how far to the left he or she is. We have a Republican that won an election, and it's doomed for the Republican Party. We never hear when a wacko leftist Democrat wins that it's doomed for the Democrat. Although, I must retract that, because I had it in the stack a couple of days. Time Magazine has a, it's really in the weeds, but they've had a deep dive into everything wrong with the Democrat Party. So if... If you if you look out there in the drive-by media, you will find stories, columns, pieces on the problems that the Democrat Party is having. There's something else going on out there. The FBI has been running a deep investigation of college basketball, and it's only the beginning. Now... I am not a college basketball fan, but I'm not a college football fan either because I don't have an alma mater, and I don't like cheap-looking uniforms compared to the professional versions. But I admire the people that do it, and, you know, it's, it's all part of the university system. But what, what, is, what has happened here, the federal government essentially dropped a bomb on college basketball yesterday indicting 10 people in a fraud and bribery scheme involving top recruits, college programs, agents, financial planners, and the shoe and apparel company Adidas. It is ugly and it is unprecedented and there's already fallout. Rick Pitino, according to Business Insider, Rick Patino, untouchable in college basketball, has been fired after the University of Louisville is linked to college basketball bribery scandal. Rick Patino. I mean, this is like, this is like, this is like firing Amos Alonzo Stagg. This is like firing Tom Landry. It happened, but you don't believe it. Head men's basketball coach Rick Patino is out at the University of Louisville one day after the FBI arrested 10 people on charges of fraud and corruption in college basketball. Patino had reportedly told his staff he expected to be fired over the allegations. A Skrull's athletic director was also let go today. According to an undercover agent working with the investigation, an executive at Adidas and several other defendants allegedly funneled $100,000 to the family of a Haskell basketball player to persuade the player to sign with an unnamed public research university in Kentucky. 
The uh, complaint doesn't name a university, but based on details provided, it was almost certainly the University of Lul, which signed a $160 million sponsorship deal with Adidas in August. The, uh, the complaint notes that the news, the allegedly bribed student would attend Lul, came out of nowhere in early June. On June 3rd, five-star recruit Brian Bowen surprised many by announcing plans to go to the University of Louisville. And I say, folks, this is the tip of the iceberg. Wait till they get into the college football aspect of this. I mean, players, college athletes are not allowed for anybody to get them spending money. They have to eat on campus provided by the screwal, but, a, you know, big booster driving around with his giant Cadillac with long horns on the uh, on the hood as a hood owner, not around, not allowed to r- drop around, drop $5,000 on a player here. Just, I mean, just to be nice, you're not allowed to do it. Players are not allowed these kind of things. Everybody knows this has been going on for years because most of these kids can't afford anything. And yet when you see them, before they've turned pro, they're wearing Jay-Z and Beyonce-style clothes and jewelry and so forth. Say, so where did that come from? Well, you know, we got a, we got an advance from the agent. Why, 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 you're not supposed to have an agent? Well, you know, it's, everybody knows it's going to happen. We're just getting a head start on it. No, 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 this can't happen. Adidas with the shoes and with the uniform. Ah, oh, folks, this is, this is, this is going to be deep and bad. And if, if, if this, does have tentacles that reach college football. It's going to turn the world upside down for a lot of people who have a purist view about athletics, college athletics, and uh, and sports endeavors. Rick Patino being fired. I that that that. It's got to be bad for that to happen. I'm still trying to think of an analogy. Somebody you think in some job that could never, ever be fired. Somebody that everybody would know. That's how earth-shattering and shaking. The and the athletic director, the AD, histoire, as, uh, as well. So let me take a break here. We'll come back. Uh, tax plan. The NFL story does not go away. And in fact, uh, i got to take a break. I have to take a break. I just got to take the what I was done being going to say about the NFL is that, and you, we got the audio somebody's coming up. Everybody now saying this isn't about the flag. This isn't about the police brutality. This isn't about, oh, yes, it is. And if they don't know that's what it is, then it proves my point. They're a bunch of tools. I've told everybody what this is all about from the get go, starting with the focus on concussions. This is an effort by the American left to damage, severely damage the NFL. And the NFL is clueless, sitting in the middle of this tornado, clueless as to what's really going on. They're caught up in all the hodgepodge of thinking this is about equality and uh, 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 fairness, whatever else they think. It's not about that. They don't want to destroy the NFL because they want to be able to fleece it. But this is about inflicting the, the NFL is an anathema to liberalism. It's masculinity. It's patriotic. It is rough and tumble. It's a team sport that requires individual greatness. Everything the left is trying to drum out of our culture. And that is not an exaggeration. That's what this is about. It's always been about that. And the racial component here is just a distraction and smokescreen. Been telling you this from the get-go. Meeting and surpassing all audience expectations every day. Great to have you with us. By the way, uh, I'm going to be on Fox News. Sean Hannity tomorrow night and Friday night. They're coming in here tomorrow morning. We're going to tape the interview uh, before the program tomorrow. And snurdly, guess who's coming down? The commie babe makeup artist is coming. They're bringing Deborah. Deborah has asked to come. The 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 commie babe that did my makeup at uh, Rush Limbaugh the TV show back 1992 to 1996. Uh, when that ended and Fox started up, she went over there, and now she's makeup supervisor, vice president makeup supervisor. But she's going to come down here and actually do the makeup. Her name is Deborah, and she's uh, she's a kick. Uh, and my my niece Kristen works on the Hannity show. She's coming, so. 
we're well, we, we're, we're going to have loads of people in here. Um, what time are they coming in to set up? Right, that's what I thought before the sun comes up. That's television. Uh, anyway, um, let's go to the audio sound bites here, folks. This is this afternoon, just moments ago, CNN Inside Politics, John King speaking with Jeff Zeleny, the senior White House correspondent, uh, about Roy Moore winning the Alabama pri- primary last night. And this is, and here's their take on Trump. President Trump spent the evening angry and venting about the loss, and then he went to bed, excuse my language, quote, embarrassed and pissed. Jeff Zeleny joins me now live from the White House. Take us inside the president's reaction and what comes next. John, those two words that you just said, sum it up pretty uh, succinctly there. The president uh, doesn't like to lose. In fact, he's not uh, used to losing in special elections, but he's also getting a taste of what President Obama got as well. It is difficult for a sitting president to campaign for anyone and hope that their supporters follow along. Well, I, I would advise the president stay out of primaries like I do, but, but they don't. Uh, they're fundraisers. They actually, I guess. But I don't know if this is true. I mean, they say that Trump's embarrassed, he's mad, uh, ticked off that he uh, was not listened to. Maybe, I mean, who knows? I wasn't in the White House last night. But I have to believe there's somebody there that can tell Trump this is a win-win for him. This doesn't mean that he's lost any influence with his voters. It means his voters have his back. But I'll tell you, it means something else, too. It means that as far as the voters are concerned, they, they're going to do what they think is necessary, whether Trump is there or not. I, I, you know, I, I think a lot of conventional wisdom people, people that have been analyzing and studying politics for years, almost can't get out of the archaic formulations that they have used and lived by analyzing politics for decades. And you have to throw all of that out now. And I don't know that they're capable of it. And by that, I mean, okay, so Trump endorses candidate A and and makes a fairly big deal about it. And, and, And Trump thinks that his voters are dead loyal to him, that they will do anything he says, uh, including continue to support him if he would shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue, he once said. So he believes that these voters are inexorably tied and there's nothing anybody can do about it. And so when he goes out and says, vote for this guy, they're automatically going to do it. Uh, And most everybody else thinks that's the way politics works. But it didn't happen in this case. And since it didn't happen, the formulaic response is, look at Trump has no influence. Look at Trump's lost his influence. Look at Trump's lost the magic that he had with his voters. And it doesn't mean that at all. What it means is that the national mood, the mood sweeping the nation that can be described as drain the swamp is strong and it is growing. And that what Trump started has taken root and it will continue to grow whether Trump is there or not. And I don't intend that as a slam at Trump. It's just reality. It's right there in the election returns last night. And if there's one thing to learn is that this movement exists. Trump may have been, well, there's no question, Trump was the individual who rallied this movement together. Might even want to call it a new political party that hasn't yet formed and organized. But this movement is there and it is growing and it is insistent, and it is it wants Trump to remain in office. And it it this this movement is devoted to the things Trump said he was going to do. And the Trump voter believes that only Trump being there can can make this possible. So they're not going to abandon Trump, but they're also not going to do things that, in their view, would harm Trump i.e. send another establishmentarian up there when there is an opportunity to send exactly the kind of person they think is necessary to participate in draining the swamp. This isn't complicated, but I don't know that they have a way. These age-old dinosaurs and their political analysis, I don't think they can step outside the box. Let's go to the audio sound bites. 
Um, not about any of this. I, I just want to get all this stuff out there and and give the discussion areas uh, a little mention here, setting up what's going to f- happen as the program unfolds today. Before your very eyes, we'll start here at the top. This is a montage. In in addition to the media desperately trying to make everybody believe that Trump's voter base is abandoning him because of this return, the election last night in Alabama. They are also trying to say that San Juan in Puerto Rico is Trump's Katrina. They are attempting attempting to establish a narrative that Trump doesn't care about people in duress. They are attempting to establish a narrative that Trump doesn't care about Puerto Rico or the people in Puerto Rico. And they're trying to recreate what they created during Hurricane Katrina and George W. Bush. Again, that's all they've got is to go back to their greatest hits and try to play them again. Instead of New Orleans and Katrina, this is Hurricane whatever it was and Puerto Rico. And here's a media montage where the drive-bys openly express their hope. That We're hearing today for the first time comparisons to Katrina. This is an extremely dire situation. It's going to become the kind of screwed up response that Katrina was. This is going to turn to be Mr. Trump's Katrina. This could turn out to be Donald Trump's Hurricane Katrina. Is Maria Donald Trump's Katrina? Is this Katrina? It could turn into Katrina yeah. or something worse than Katrina. This could be our modern day Katrina. The Katrina moment for Donald Trump. Is this his Katrina? I want you to think of Katrina. Reminiscent of a storm I covered in New Orleans a few years ago. I hope it's not because Puerto Rico has a lot of brown people. There you have it. There, That was sunny. Sonny Hostin, Sonny Hostin there on The View. I hope it's not. Well, have you heard Hillary saying in her book, I hope Trump hasn't decided to start shooting journalists? You know, you know well, apparently I've seen it two different places, but even if it's, even, here's a woman. How many mysterious deaths have surrounded the Clintons their entire political lives? And now she's supposedly writing, she worries Trump might be out there murdering. I mean, there's there's a name that I'm just dying to say. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> but I just find you don't you think it's a hoax? You know, I've seen two different stories. I've seen two different stories. I'll double check it now that you think it's a hoax. But I mean, it's 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 either is or isn't. It's in there in her book, supposedly. A woman's losing her mind. You realize this? You know about poison? This. Is an inner. She was not equipped for this gig. She's not equipped for it at all. She can't handle this loss. She can't handle anything about it. She's, I mean, whining and, and, and moaning and complaining in public like this. Jeez. It's uh, not a pretty picture out there. It's painful to listen to, it's painful to look at this. It's always been painful to look at, painful to watch Hillary Clinton in action. This, this is, uh, this is, even if this is a hoax, the other things that she's, uh, Doing and saying. Anyway, I saw Geraldo down in San Juan. Sturdily walked in here today, and and, and Geraldo sitting in a place looked like a bar, at a resort down in in Puerto Rico. And I said, well, <laughs> the place must be in trouble. Geraldo's there. The Grim Reaper has been sent to. When Fox sends Geraldo somewhere, there's death somewhere has happened. You make book on it. And he was down there, but he's saying it's Katrina, and it, 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 it's it's all made up. It's again, it's the media hoping that what they report becomes true. They're trying to make it true. They're all in on it, and it isn't going to work either. Wonder how long it's going to take for them to realize that the greatest hits from their playbook will work against a Romney or a George W. Bush or anybody else in the insider elites, but it's not going to work against Trump. How long is it going to take him to figure this out? One quick one here before we go to the uh, to the break, and this is about the NFL, and there's a huge NFL stack here today, folks, and not a lot of it is repetitive. Huge NFL stack here today. Big, big trouble for the Steelers in Pittsburgh over what happened. On Sunday in Chicago, that's that that has monumental 
possibilities to it as well. But this morning on the Fox Business Network, Stuart Varney show, talking to Steve Cortez. He's the Hispanic Advisory Council member, Trump Hispanic Advisory Council member. And they're talking about my take, one of my many takes, on the situation involving the NFL. Rush Limbaugh came on and said, he said, look, football has lost its joy. What do you make of right. that? Now, and he said it, it's lost its mystique, the NFL, which I think it has, mm. unfortunately. Sadly, the NFL has, you know, I think gone out very, very far on a limb here, has disrespected America, disrespected cops, disrespected the military, and thankfully it's going to pay a financial price. This is also a league, an organization, which has received enormous amounts of corporate welfare, frankly, yeah. from the American taxpayer, which I think is despicable. Mm -hmm. For example, Heinz Field, where the Steelers play, the Steelers who refused to come out for the National Anthem on Sunday, Heinz Field, the majority of the funding for that field, $170 million, was the taxpayers of Pittsburgh and of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I hope in the future we are done with that nonsense. Yeah, the, the, the Steelers management, you know, they played the old, we're going to move card if we don't get the stadium. Even in Pittsburgh, they played that card. I mean, they didn't, not heavily, they threw it out one time. They make a big deal of it, but they did play that card before they. Yeah, I knew it. I knew it wasn't a hoax. Hillary did say that she hopes Trump isn't going to start shooting journalists. At them. You thought that was a hoax, but it's not. It's real. It's in the book. Anyway, um, th th this NFL business, as I say, the stack is growing, and it's not all repetitive. We've got that. We got the Republican tax plan that was introduced. One thing about these tax plans, you know, it's okay to have a reaction, and, and this clearly deserves one. But what they put forth in the early stages is never what they end up voting on. This is going to go through a whole bunch of changes and other things, and it may never get to a vote like Obamacare. You have to realize what we're talking about. We're, we're talking about people who don't want to really do anything on taxes. They're forced to make it look like they're working hard on making changes in the tax code. But just like with Obama, they didn't really want to do it. So then they give themselves a starting point here that is, is guaranteed to produce massive objections, which it is and has, and including some for me coming up. Correction, correction. Hillary didn't say in her book she hopes Trump is not going to shoot journalists. She said it on TV. PBS, Charlie Rose, last night, question, do you believe Trump is sexist? I believe he has a very deep fascination for authoritarians, and in particular for Putin. I think he not only likes Putin, I think he would like to be like Putin. In what way? In the way that he sees Putin as this sort of macho guy who basically gets to do whatever he wants to do in his country. And I don't think, as Trump himself has said, he understood the complexity of governing, how hard it was, what it meant to try to bring people together uh, in a uh, democracy. Uh, uh, he never understood, but I don't think he really values so democracy, why? Charlie. OK, so he doesn't value democracy. No, he's a top down guy. He's an authoritarian. He's no different than Putin. Well, he, you know, hopefully hasn't ordered the killing of people and journalists and the like. Hopefully. He hasn't ordered. Now, you realize how much of that bite is also formulaic. It's all about the Russians colluded with Trump and stole the election from her. And so Trump wants to be like Putin. It, 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 this, I think, illustrates her intellectual constraints. I, I, I don't think this woman is mentally capable of independent critical thought. I think she's the product of slogans and snippets, philosophical beliefs, just regurgitates them in different words, different language now and then. But she's really intellectually limited. I believe. This is embarrassing. That whole sound by Hillary. That, that isn't, I think he wants to be Putin. I think he loves Putin. I think he's a Putin. The only reason that's in her mind is because of this silly idea they have that Putin and Trump colluded and stole her election from her. Anyway, let me get to the phones to get started there. Dayton, Ohio. Kim, great to have you. Welcome to the program. Hi, Rush. Hey. How are you? Thank you. I, I'm so nervous. I've been listening to you since 1988. But, well, uh, it makes you a lifer. Uh, 
I'm a lifer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, let's go back to the Alabama results from last night really quick. You have it almost right. You're the only one that is close. Even anybody on Fox is has got this whole thing wrong about why Trump uh, endorsed Strange. Here, here, here's 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 why. Tell Trump, us, tell us, tell us. Time is vanishing. Uh, tell us. Uh, okay, Trump endorsed Strange because regardless of the outcome last night, Strange was still going to be in the Senate voting until December. Because the election for that seat is in December. So he needs Strange in there to vote for if the health care came up, taxes, infrastructure, whatever. The last thing he needed was Strange on the end of a thumb pointing down like another McCain moment. Well, you know what? You may, you may have a point. You, that, 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 that is very forward critical thinking, much unlike what Hillary Clinton's capable of. If Hillary had said that, Putin would be worried about thumbs up or thumbs down. I have a story here from Breitbart that says Trump was mad last night, but not at the election results. He's mad at Kushner for giving him the wrong suggestion, the wrong advice. That's the story Breitbart has. If you ask me, Hillary Clinton is far more like Vladimir Putin than Trump is. I mean, come on. Hillary got filthy rich. Selling her power. Trump got rich the old-fashioned way. He earned it. Made and sold stuff that people wanted. Hillary asked for people to give her money. Or else. That's what Putin does to you. Or else. Yeah, I got the Breitbart story right here. And that's who they say Trump's mad at is his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. And that's because that uh, Kushner apparently keeps giving Trump bad advice. Now, uh, this is Breitbart. Uh, and then the Bannon falling out with Trump. And I don't, I don't think Breitbart's off the reservation here. I think some people think now that Breitbart aligning with Bannon's anti-Trump. Now, I don't think that's a case at all. Well, it is, it's a chill out here. And realize everything going on here, it, it, it all makes sense if you look at it uh, just objectively as you can. Now, here's a... Here's a pull quote. One thing I do know is true. Trump hates to lose. So I, I would believe he would be a little bit upset in there last night over the outcome of the election. And you know what family is for? Family is a different different thing. You can have the closest advisors in the world working for you. People you've known all your life. Family is different. Family is always going to hold sway. I have exceptions, of course, but... Uh, and Kushner has always been a highly valued member of the Trump family and now of the team. But get this pull quote. In what is becoming a disturbing pattern, Trump's son-in-law and advisor, Jared Kushner, was apparently one of those who advised Trump to back Luther Strange to once again sail into big jagged rocks, a humiliation for Trump that anyone with real-world political sense should have seen coming from a mile away. Appointed under shady circumstances, Strange is a walking, talking poster child for everything Trump ran against. He is a good old boy, Republican establishment backslapper, strongly backed by McConnell, who has done nothing but post failure after failure since Trump's inauguration. True. Now, I heard that Trump did this, uh, trying to appease McConnell, that he wasn't blind about what he was doing here but that he was trying to forge relationships on Capitol Hill to move his agenda forward. Uh, now we hear that Kushner was behind the advice. and But I can, I can firmly believe Kushner would give this advice. I mean, Kushner is uh, family or establishment types, and Kushner is a Democrat. Not going to hold any of this against him. I'm just trying to explain why I think it's going to understand about happening. Uh, something else, too. We had that caller with a good theory in the first hour that Trump endorsed Strange because Strange is going to be there through December. And he needs Strange supportive. He doesn't need Strange doing a McCain thumbs down on everything that might come up. Could be. Uh, but the headline of the piece is Luther Strange endorsement, just the latest awful advice Trump received from Jared Kushner. 
Breitbart says here, moreover, Kushner's objectivity, uh, I'm sorry, objectively awful advice to back Strange has succeeding in doing the only thing that could be fatal to Trump's presidency and re-election prospects, and that has driven a wedge between the president and his supporters. This time, the wedge appears to be temporary, and the supporters are forgiving. I don't think there's a wedge at all here. I think Trump supporters are far more sophisticated than anybody realizes. Politically sophisticated. They know plenty. They know clearly enough to know what's wrong with it. They know enough about politics to know what to be mad at. They know enough about politics to be energized and show up and vote and try to do something about it. They're not bumpkins. They are portrayed as bumpkins. They're portrayed as racists. They're portrayed as white supremacists. They're being slandered. They're being smeared. They're being slimed, and that's not who they are. They love Donald Trump. Trump made a mistake in his endorsement. They're not going to throw Trump over the board, overboard or under the bus because everything is much bigger than that. It isn't personal. In their view, the country is at a crossroads. And getting upset at Trump and abandoning Trump over this would be, in their view, petty. The big picture dwarfs this one election. They took care of it at the ballot box. Pure and simple. And in doing so, they had Trump's back. I know that's, you know, wait till the drive-bys hear that. That is in such contravention of the way they're thinking. You hear what Limbaugh said? Limbaugh said that the uh, voters in Alabama actually had Trump's back, that they're not mad at him. Exactly right. Trump endorsed. They knew it was the wrong guy. They voted for the right guy. Don't hold anything against Trump. They know what Trump's up against. And I think they're, they're very tolerant. They're, they're not at all. These voters nationwide are not at all the way the media has caricatured them. They're not at all the way establishment politicians, Republicans and Democrats think of them. And this was just the uh, latest illustration. Okay, quickly, the Republican tax plan. Now, I didn't lead with this in terms of going full bore into it. I mentioned it at the top. Because it's just the presentation day, and what gets voted on, if there is a vote, is going to be different than what this is. This is the opener. In it are a bunch of trial balloons, gauge people's reactions. It's like any, any military plan. You have a battle plan. And the moment shots are fired, the battle plan changes. Same thing here. But let's go through what this plan is. Are you familiar with it, Mr. Snurdly? Have you had time in your busy work? Well, how about first, a surcharge. This is a Republican tax plan. A surcharge, i.e. a tax increase on the wealthiest Americans. A surcharge. My buddy that I keep telling you about that only voted for Trump for tax cut, he is livid today. He's talking about a day that will live in infamy and all because of that one aspect of this. I don't know who came up with it. I, I don't know who's put it in there. But here we go. Trump has two red lines that he refuses to cross on overhauling. overhauling. This is an AP story, by the way, so... We take it all under advisement. But they say that Trump has two red lines that he refuses to cross, overhauling taxes. The corporate rate must be cut to 20 percent and tax cuts. They call them savings here. You talk about bastardizing the language. Tax cuts are called savings for who? Savings. That's the language. Savings must go to the middle class. The savings. It's called tax cuts. What this means is that the, the, the bulk of the, or the leaf, the bulk of the tax cuts most go to the middle class. Those are the two things that the Associated Press says that Trump will not compromise on. Gary Cohn, the president's top economic aide, says any overhaul signed by the president needs to have those two elements. Corporate rate down to 20 and the bulk of the tax cut to the middle class. Trump had initially pushed for cutting the top rate, 39.6, corporate rate, to 15%. Is the corporate rate 39.6? I 
I thought the corporate rate was 35. Well, whatever. He wants it cut to 15. And it looks like it's going to be 20, at least right now. And that's what he said. It will never, it will not be over 20% on the corporate side or I'm not signing it. Uh, the administration says the benefits of any tax cut will not favor the wealthy, with Gary Cohn saying that an additional tax bracket could be added to levy taxes on the top 1% of earners if needed to pay for the savings for the middle class. So a surcharge and an additional tax bracket that nobody's supposed to worry about because they're not in the 1%. I told you yesterday this is a populist tax plan, not conservative. And the Republicans are demonstrating they are not conservative. Trump is not. He's not an ideological conservative. It does. It sounds exactly like what Democrats would hatch up. Even the lingo, the savings. This is like, I need to protect my players. I'm going to keep them in the locker room. Protect? Yes, I need to protect the protesters. Protect the protesters? Protect them from what? Well, from protesting. Oh. The Senate's top Democrat is blasting the plan as a giveaway to the rich. <laughs> Folks, well, this, this, this is, this is just, it's so, this is all just Washington BS. Here come the Republicans. Here comes Trump proposing a major tax reform that includes big tax relief for the middle class and a reduction in the corporate tax rate and a huge increase in taxes on the wealthy. And what do the Democrats say? It's a giveaway to the rich. That's from Chuck U. Schumer. Chuck U. Schumer says that Trump's plan only gives crumbs to the middle class, while top bracket earners making more than half a million dollars a year would reap a windfall. With a surcharge and a new tax bracket for them. Chuck Yu uh, also blasted a plan for actually increasing the bottom tax rate from 10% to 12%, calling it a punch to the gut of working Americans. By the way, that does happen. The 10% rate goes to 12% in this <laughs> Republican plan. Uh, the, the plan. They plan to be officially released this afternoon. Top item on Washington's agenda after the Republican failure on health care. As of 9.30 this morning, 9.20, President Trump and congressional Republicans proposing a tax plan they say will be simple and fair. In a document obtained by the AP, they outline a blueprint for almost doubling the standard deduction for married taxpayers filing jointly to 24000 and 12000 for individuals. That's okay. Take that. The plan calls for cutting the corporate rate. I knew it was 35. These people at AP don't even know what it's not. 39.6 is the personal rate. The corporate rate's 35. Plan calls for cutting that to 20%. The Republican proposal also calls for reducing a number of tax brackets from 7 to 3 with a surcharge on the wealthiest Americans. Now, wait a second. Did you know there were seven tax brackets? Because in 1986, there were three. In 1986, after, after the tax reform plan of Reynoldus Magnus, there were three tax plans. There were 31, 28, and 15, or 10, 15, and 28, and some people ended up paying 31 for a couple of dollars they earned. And back then, everybody said, this is, this is great, but a bunch of deductions vanished then, too. And I said, you watch what's going to happen. The rates are going to go back up, and the deductions are gone. And this has happened. Now we get seven rates out there again. This takes them back to three. And a surcharge... On the wealthiest Americans, the plan leaves intact the deduction for mortgage interest and charitable deductions. So that's what they're going to present this afternoon. As I say, what gets presented is not what gets voted on. And I'm telling you, I'm not sure they want to do this either. Uh, just like, you know, all the, all the words and all the promises and all the intentions on Obamacare. And it's, it's, there's not a damn thing has been done to that. 
it's it's embarrassing. It's it's infuriating. It is embarrassing. It is it is just it's outrageous that they don't want to do anything about Obamacare or that they can't or whatever. And using intelligence guided by experience. So here comes a tax reform plan because everybody knows that's what Trump wants. Here comes a silly proposal. It's got all this wacko stuff in it. Surcharge on the wealthy. A new tax bracket for the wealthy. Guaranteed to make middle class and poor Democrats cheer. That's what they've been conditioned to do. Anybody doing better than they do that gets punished, they think that's great. They applaud it. Democrats have conditioned their voters to enjoy the pain, the presumed pain of others, especially if it doesn't mean anything positive for them, such as your average middle class family Democrat voters sitting out there and say, uh, Waco. And their tax cut doesn't happen. It's maybe 1% or 2%. No big deal. Not going to make a big difference. But they hear the rich are getting soaked, and they think it's great. It doesn't change their life at all, but they have been conditioned to support harm and enjoy others apparently getting snookered. And that's what the Democrat Party has done. That's how they do not provide relief for their own people. They told them, you should be happy. These rich people, they're getting soaked. We're soaking them. And Democrat voters applaud that while it doesn't mean anything positive for them. But we'll see where this goes. Uh, it's, it's like Snurdly said. I mean, you read this, and it sounds like something written by a bunch of Democrats, including even the language. Donald Trump's on the way to Indiana to uh, give a speech about the tax cut plan. He stopped for a little miniature presser with the drive-bys out there, said a couple of things. He said that they have the votes for the health care bill. They've got the votes, but some senators in the hospital and can't vote by the deadline. So they're going to wait until early 2018. Trump said he's considering an executive order on associations which would allow coverage and buying of insurance across state lines, which will fix a lot of Obamacare. The insurance companies are opposed to that, by the way. You would think the insurance companies would love that just on the surface, but they don't like it because they've got monopolies in the states. By allowing insurance companies to sell across state lines, it brings in additional insurance options to customers within states, causing competition. It blows up the monopolies. It's the insurance industry that's been standing in the way of that, folks. Um, Trump also said he thinks the NFL is in a box. In my opinion, the NFL has to change or their business is going to hell. I've been making this point since Monday. Uh, and we, as I say, we have an NFL stack that's building and audio sound bites coming up, looking forward to getting into it. Uh, so many people are, I, again, they're close, but they're missing what, what actually is the objective here of the people behind what's happening. And it isn't the players. The players are like most other protesters at events. They're, they're, they're what you see, but they're not the brains behind it. And that's not a take on their intelligence. I'm just saying that there are people responsible for this, making things happen, and the players are caught up in it. And they, I'm sure they many have seriously believe what they're doing. They just don't know what they're doing. Well, they wouldn't be doing it if they did. Just trust me on this. I'll explain this as the uh, program unfolds. You know something else interesting about Alabama? You notice the polling was dead on? You notice the polling in this Alabama Senate race was dead on accurate. Now, why do you think that might be the case? Come on. No, it's not that. It's not that they didn't have a vested interest. It's not that there were no Democrats to oversample. It's a Republican primary. Simple. No Democrats to oversample, so they got a dead, solid, accurate result. The polling was dead on here throughout this whole race. Was it not? Okay, 
We had to call some people back yesterday. I promised them we would because they held on for a long time. We didn't get to them. Here's the first. This is Luann in um, in Indiana. Great to have you, Luann. Thank you for letting us call you back. Thank you, Rush. I'm so, I can't believe I'm talking to you that you are my hero. I just, if I could just take a minute and just tell you a little bit about how much you mean to me and my family. 30 years ago, I was an empty-headed little liberal. I had no idea. I just assumed that Ronald Reagan must have been a dummy because that's what the media all said. And then I started listening to you. I'm a lifer. I'm, I'm a 29-year listener, okay? And it was like the light, the light bulb came on. And since then, I have read conservative authors and listened to other conservative people, and um, now I know exactly why I'm conservative. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you very much. You have you have made my day. I, I can't <laughs> well, tell you, you how. Mine just about every time I listen to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, the reason I called is because I wanted to touch on this uh, strategy, this little ugly little game that the left plays called divide and conquer. And originally. Um, I was calling in relation to the NFL, but actually, now I think about it, it actually is going to apply to the upcoming tax battle that's going to be coming up, okay? And these insights, I really can't take all credit for them because I, I did read Shelby Steele and I, his insight about how uh, one side is pitted against the other and the other has to purchase their innocence, you know. Right, that's, that's exactly really... what I said this yesterday, with liberalism is about dividing people. It isn't about unity. Look, i got to take a break here, Luann. Hang on. Don't go anywhere. Don't hang up. Sit right there. Okay, we're back on the Rush Limbaugh program at Luann in Lakeville, Indiana. Luann, before you uh, resume here, I, I want to focus on something she said. She mentioned Shelby Steele. Folks, this is so dead right on. Luann made a great point mentioning Shelby Steele, that our side, this is Shelby Steele's theory, it's just dead on. We have to purchase our innocence. Now, what that means, the left is always presumed to have the moral high ground. The left is always presumed to be morally correct and to have the best of intentions. But we, who are not leftists, we have to make some grand gesture in word or deed or money to show that we are not racist or bigots or homophobes or whatever. And even then, it doesn't work. David Koch gives $50 million, $25 million to a hospital in New York, and the left rejects it, claiming he's simply trying to fool people that he's not a racist. And it's true, and we fall for this. We, we, we make these grand gestures. We go out of the way to try to demonstrate that we aren't racist. And this is as divisive as anything you could imagine. When we fall for it, uh, we automatically, by falling for it, surrender to them the moral high ground. The, they, they own the presumption they are correct. They are morally correct. They're, they're perfect. Um, and it's we who are the bigots and so forth. And that's got to stop because that is how they extract and force this division throughout our culture. And I, I before you went on, Luann, I wanted to emphasize that because that's exactly right what Shelby Steele had said. And your, your quoting of it there was perfect. Well, thank you, Rush. Um, and I really, you know, anybody who's interested in the book, it won a Pulitzer Prize about 20 years ago. It's called The Content of Our Character, which, of course, comes directly from Martin Luther King. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, the way I see this game, if I could just, you know, um, it seems like the left wants to control everything. They want to assign the teams. They want to make the rules. And the way, you know, if you're black or female or gay or whatever, you get to join the team called the aggrieved team. They have a grievance, okay? And everybody else is on the evil oppressor team. And, you know, they, they constantly reopen old wounds, injuries that should have healed a long time ago. And it's not a healthy dynamic. This they don't allow them to heal. This is game. And the only way... To win it is to not play it. Exactly right. And don't play it. Don't yeah. react to them and don't let them occupy the moral high ground. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the, when I read Shelby Steele, I, I remember thinking to myself, I don't have to purchase my innocence. I own my innocence. 
and it makes it makes me sad when I see these Michael Brown incidents being exploited like that. But I I can't play that game. Let me give you another example of this. I don't mean to be harping on somebody here, but it's just a great example. Yesterday, Art Rooney II, who now runs the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, put on the Steelers website a letter to the fans explaining why they didn't come out for the national anthem in Chicago on Sunday. And he said, because we wanted to uh, avoid making a political statement. Yeah. Now, stop and think of that. Standing for the anthem. Yeah. I guess it's perceived as making a political statement. The truth is, standing for the anthem is not politics. That's how you do not make a political statement. Not standing for the anthem is the political statement. Yeah. And this is how things get reversed. Yes. I think the coaches are stuck in this conundrum. I wish the coaches would understand this dynamic, you know, and just don't play that game. Well, (laughs) the coaches... They, on one side of their mouth, will say, I can't tell these men what to do. I can't tell these guys what it, and then tells them what to do. Yeah. Where to be, what time to be there, what they can eat and can't eat, what they can dress, what yes. the fine's going to be if they violate any rule. But when it comes to this stuff, I can't tell these men what to do. Look, Luann, I have to go, but I, I, you were going to be offered a brand new iPhone 8 or 8 Plus yesterday because Ooh. it was iPhone 8 Plus day yesterday, and, and I didn't get to you. So I promised everybody that we called back from yesterday. You do you want one? You don't have to take it if you're not a big if you're not a cell phone person. Well, absolutely, I do. Thank you so much. Which kind would you like? The big one, the eight plus, or the uh, the smaller one? I think the big one. And do you have a color preference? Uh, uh, how about silver? Oh, they are gorgeous. Oh, they are. They're almost white. Oh, on the back. Well, that is so generous, Rush. You're what? Now they come SIM free, so you can use this on any carrier that you have. Okay. So if you'll hang on, uh, Mr. Snurdly will be back with you to get your address, so we can get it out to you. Thank uh, you so much. You God are bless you, Rush. more than welcome. By the way, I don't know if you people know it. You haven't probably haven't discovered it yet, but Apple has really, really, really simplified and improved. The process of setting up your new phone. You no longer have to use iTunes. This is incredible. You get your new phone and you turn it on. And you get your old phone and you turn it on. You put them side by side. On the new phone, it'll ask you to input what country you're in and what your language is. And then it'll ask you to enter the user code you used to unlock the old phone on the new one. And then you get a splash page that says instant startup. And all you do is pair the two phones together, which takes a second, and all the settings and all of your preferences transfer from the old phone to the new as they're side-by-side with no wires. And then it asks you, do you want to restore the phone from a backup on iCloud or set it up as new? Restore from an iCloud backup, and in a half hour, you're done. Your apps, your passwords all come from iCloud Keychain. It's the simplest And they're not touting this. They're not touting this at all. You don't have to connect to iTunes. You don't have to do an iTunes encrypted backup. That was the preferred way of doing it to get your passwords. It all happens. Uh, It's just, and it'll be that way with, it's with the iPhone 8, 8 Plus, and with the iPhone 10 uh, when it comes out. So uh, thank you again, Luann. Who's next? This is Russ from uh, Kansas City. Great to have you, Russ. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, Give me 11 seconds. I've got just a few uh, of things that I am in earnest agreement with you, Rush. Number one, President Trump knows exactly what he is doing and saying. He has a war room, I believe, so to speak, and a flow chart on everything that he says and the anticipated outcome to a 95 percent factor. President Trump says things in public that we, his base, what we have had to say in private for at least the last eight years. He is our voice. His comments are proactive instead of reactive over 90% of the time. I believe he has a storyboard of tweets already to go at least 30 days in advance. All he's waiting for is a dim to ask for it, and he will deliver. Uh, President Truman and President Trump, outside of the first four letters of last name being the same, are very similar in decision-making. They tell the truth, no guts, no glory, neither lie. They tell the truth. That's why it's so easy to keep up with them. They don't diddle-daddle. And um, 
uh, Puerto Rico, I think, is a little bit different thing as far as instant help because it's a uh, it's not a state, it's a territory, and they have massive uh, massive financial problems uh, that could affect other states. I'm not real sure about that. I need well, to you know, on Puerto, Puerto Rico, Rico, you're right. Every everybody understands this. This is why the media is flailing away and missing big time. Puerto Rico is not a state, and and there aren't any pictures of nobody helping down there. They, they, they're just trying. They don't know anything other than their greatest hits in the playbook, and all they know how to do is recycle them. So Katrina worked against Bush, so it's automatically going to work against Trump. No, it won't. They still haven't come to grips, and I don't think they ever will, of who Trump is. But more importantly, who and what Trump is not. Uh, here, this is a great illustration. This is a story from the uh, Business Insider. Here's the headline. Are you ready? North Korea is apparently so confused by Trump that it's asking U.S. experts for help. North Korea is apparently so confused by Donald Trump that it's asking experts for help in understanding him. According to a Washington Post report yesterday, government officials have been soliciting via various back channels U.S. experts, Korean government officials, with ties to the Republican Party for informal talks. Their number one concern is Trump, an unnamed analyst told Anna Fifield, the newspaper's Tokyo bureau chief. They can't figure him out. Uh, this is just where Trump wants the guy. So the little pot dictator doesn't know what to make of Trump. Why do you think that is? Is What is Trump saying? It's confusing. I've understood everything Trump has said. It's, it's clearer. It's more succinct. It's get in, get it, and get out than any Diplo speak you will ever hear. There is no way to misunderstand or be confused by what Donald Trump is saying unless you're used to dealing with people who never tell you the truth or when they do, they disguise it in some way that you can't ever pin it back on them. Trump does not do diplomatic speak. Trump does not do symbolism and all that. He gets in, gets it, and gets out. Donald Trump has been very clear what's going to happen to North Korea if they don't stop this stuff. And so now North Korea doesn't know what this means, and they're asking U.S. experts to help them understand Trump. The problem with that is that the people they're calling don't understand Trump either. North Korea, so confused by Trump, it's asking U.S. experts, like, who would that be? Calling Madeleine Albright? Calling Bill Clinton? Calling Hillary? No, she, they, apparently they're calling Republicans, uh, asking, what is this... What does it mean when Trump says that we're going to be bombed out of existence? What does he mean by that? (laughs) Classic. uh, Ladies and gentlemen, Alan Jones, the CEO of Hardwick Clothing and Check Into Cash Payday Loan Company, announced yesterday that he has finished sponsoring the wardrobes and advertising on the NFL. Hardwick Clothing is America's oldest suit maker. In his statement, Alan Jones said our companies will not condone unpatriotic behavior. The uh, Times Free Press, that's a newspaper, two years ago, Cleveland, Tennessee, businessman Alan Jones was proudly showing off his newly acquired Hardwick Clothing brand suits by providing the wardrobe for NBC's on-air talent during the network's broadcast of NFL games. But after players and coaches challenged Trump, and many took a knee during the national anthem, Alan Jones said he's through sponsoring the wardrobes or advertising on stations that air the NFL. Same thing with the founder of Check Into Cash. They pulled ads from NFL games, denouncing the league as uh, unpatriotic. These are uh, two sponsors, uh, regional. Uh, Of course, the... The plug for NBC clothing is is a big deal. But here's something else. And this, folks, I I think, I'm not sure, but I think it's unprecedented. How many of you are subscribers on DirecTV to the NFL Sunday ticket? Well, if you know anything about it, if you are, you know that you cannot cancel. You cannot get a refund. 
Once you buy a subscription for the season, you own it. And it auto-renews unless you tell them you don't want to. Until now. Paid subscribers to DirecTV's Sunday ticket package have begun demanding refunds, and the demand has grown large enough to pressure DirecTV to reverse its long-held policy and grant the refunds. Remember all those people who said this is going to backfire on Trump and who said that uh, uh, this is going to end up a plus for the NFL, and it was never going to be that you can't, you cannot have a business nationwide marketed to every adult in the country. You cannot have that business grow when its on-air presentation features disrespectful actions to the symbols of the country. It, it just it isn't going to work. I don't care what leftists think of the progress they've made, and I, I don't care uh, what the media thinks or any of this. This country is still this country, and there are certain traditions and institutions that the left may think they own and control along with the media, but they don't yet. There is no way the NFL grows out of this. There is, it's not possible. And this was one of the reasons I'm sad about it. Uh, but there's, there's so much more than that going on here. I keep promising to get into it, and news keeps breaking. So I'll, uh, I'll make a concerted effort to get to the NFL stack because it's good. And the audio sound bites top of the next hour. Now back to the phones to Belmont, North Carolina. Hi, Jeb. Great to have you with us. Hey, R- hey, Rush. Great. I mean, huge honor to talk to you. I want to be real quick about this because I know you're coming up on a hard break. But with the health care bill failing and knowing that the Democrats are now going to try to get Republican rhinos to try to help them out to, quote, fix it, the Obamacare, we know fix means throw money at it. So let's see where the money is and what the money is. And that's the payoff to the insurance companies that are losing money under Obamacare. So knowing that the liberals hate the, the compensation packages that these CEOs get, we use that as leverage and say, okay, libs, we'll work with you. We'll give you the money that you want. In turn, we get to dictate or at least have huge impact on what these CEOs and executives at these insurance companies get in their compensation packages, because now we're paying you. So that would then hang it on the CEOs to say, are you going to cut your pay, or are you going to pass on the money and hang the uh, the American public out to dry? Make them the bad guys. Uh, you're, you're, wait a minute. You, you, are you suggesting the Republicans ask to take control of compensation pay for insurance company CEOs? I don't say take control of, but let's say have some serious impact or or say on what their packages are. Knowing that man, I don't want to open that door. I I'm sorry. I do. There is no way under the Bill Clinton tried this in one of his tax cut plans. Remember, he's worked harder than he'd ever worked. I, I've worked hard on this thing, and, and it, aside aside from <laughs> some stuff with Jennifer, I've worked harder on this than anything in my life, and I just can't find a way. To give you that middle class tax cut, I promise. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. We're going to put a $1 million limit on the deduction companies can cake after paying their CEOs way too much. And no way. Hold, I, don't, I don't want the government involved in anything anybody makes except their own employees. I know what you're thinking, but I don't want to open that door. I don't want to get see that door. Fastest three hours in media news breaking constantly. I haven't gotten to 10% of the stuff I prepared. Well, it's it's more than that, but I've only been able to do a sentence or two on everything. Had all kinds of stuff laid out, but we'll kick up here with uh, the latest of the National Football League. And there's some funny and compelling stuff there. So we'll be right back, and we'll just screech right into it, folks, when we get back here. Okay, so here I am. I'm all ready to get into football stack. And what happens, I look up at CNN... And they've got a graphic. Trump says he's willing to work with Democrats on health care repeal. 
And they're blowing gaskets over there. They're having orgasms at CNN because Trump said he'll work with Democrats on health care. And, of course, they love that. Jumping all over this. It was in his impromptu press conference at the White House when he was on the way to the helicopter to catch Air Force One on the way to Indiana. He did say it. But Trump also said that they have the votes uh, when one of the senators gets out of a hospital. Uh, but he said he'll work with Democrats, didn't say he's going, say he's going to, but he's already worked with the Democrats once before on the debt limit and other things. And, uh, you know, I, what is the news here? This is not news, but to CNN it is because they think Trump's caving. They think they're forcing Trump to cave. And anything that they can see or report that makes it look like there is unrest or disunity on the Republican Party side, that's all CNN needs to think they're having a great successful day. And it's all rooted in the fact that they still do not know who Trump is or try to understand him. They're still plugging him in to the, 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 the jigsaw puzzle that is Washington, D.C., inside the Beltway and inside the establishment, the swamp. And they don't know what Trump might mean or might not mean. They don't know to whom Trump is sending a signal. And on the, on the other side of this is, if your Republican Party, look, the Republicans just gave up. The Republican Party just gave up on repealing Obamacare. Now, Trump says they've got the votes if they get the guy out of the hospital the first part of the year. The Republican Party gave up. What's he supposed to do? He said he was going to reform Obamacare and repeal and replace it and so forth. And something is going to have to be done. If it if it's left alone, it's going to implode and it's going to lead to single payer anyway. That's what it was designed to do. But don't don't panic over this. I know not many of you watch CNN anyway. But they're just having the grandest time. They just think that this is another way they're going to beat Trump and pound the Republicans into the sand. And the Republicans are doing that all on their own. Okay, welcome back. Rush Limbaugh here at 800-282-2882. If you want to be on the program, the email address, lrushbo, eibnet.us. Let me state here at the outset in the getting into the NFL stack here that what this is really all about, and it began in earnest with the focus by the media on brain injury, concussion, suicide, early death of players in the National Football League. Throughout every walk of life, the number of Americans who commit suicide is a greater percentage than those who play in the NFL. The number of people with brain injuries far greater in other walks of life than in the NFL. It's not reported this way. Why? The effort here that is underway is to, it, it's one of two things. It's either to destroy the NFL or weaken it to the point of taking it over. And I don't think the people that work at the NFL have any idea what's happening here. Because many of them are themselves Democrats. And if they lean any particular way, it's leftist. And they, I don't think, understand the full force and intentions of the extreme activists on the left. What we see is a protest against the flag. What we see is a protest against America led by Colin Kaepernick. But that's not what's driving this. What's driving this is a desire to damage the NFL. It's because the NFL represents so much of what the left hates. Now, this is going to sound extreme to many of you who have not spent a lot of time listening here and who are not well steeped in the ideological uh, formations of this country and if you have if you if you're not steeped in them and if you don't if you're not aware of just how ideological the left is and its objectives are then hearing the truth of them and their intentions can be Come on, Russ, that can't possibly be true. But it is, and there's evidence all over our country that what I'm going to say is true in other venues. On college campus today, you can easily sign up for a course on 
the demasculinization of American culture. Uh, it's a combination of efforts brought about by feminists and other uber leftists who wish to create division in the country while slashing and chipping away at what they have considered the unfair power base that has run this country since the days of our founding. White Christians would be one way to characterize that group. Uh, white men would be another way to characterize that group. But it is an assault on the traditions and institutions that define the country and its greatness and that have sustained it. They have successfully attacked and redefined marriage. Uh, they have moved on now to uh, the, the transgender things that confuse bathroom use. And all of this is to divide people, and it's to set up one side with a moral high ground and the other side guilty, and they are the oppressors, and they need to be silenced. There is uh, an effort here to attack the NFL because the NFL has direct roots to patriotism, masculinity. It is all man. It is a man's game. It is played by men, and there aren't too many men who can play it at the professional level. It's an attack on all of those things and institutions that the left thinks need to be erased in our culture so that we can have what they claim to want as a fair and equal and diverse society. Now, all of that may say, you kidding, Russ, they don't want to take out the NFL. Yes, they do, folks, because it stands as a strong and powerful signal of what they still have yet left to do. It also is a pile of money. The NFL is a giant pile of money that can be shaken down with lawsuits, the threat of lawsuits, The NFL can be accused of killing its employees just by being in business. There's any number of ways that they're going about this. It's underway. And the current iteration of this got started. The Kaepernick taking a knee provided the opportunity for leftists to seize control of this and use it and expand it beyond whatever Kaepernick's intentions were. He has become the face of it. He has become the uh, the victim example of the horrible unfairness and racism of the ownership and the league. The sports media falls right in line and paints that very picture. The sports media is covering the NFL in, in a way that makes the league impossible to look good and to shine and to grow. And it's it's all done because what people don't understand about the left, the left is they don't understand live and let live. There's no such thing. Anything that exists outside of what they think should exist is going to be attacked and they're going to try to damage it or destroy it. And they get around to everything eventually. The Republican Party has been a long held target. Conservatism is a long target they've had that will never go away. They have gone after any number. They've tried to blame SUVs and automobile manufacturers for climate change, global warming. Uh, You you can pick your big pharma, uh, big retail, big oil, uh, big capitalism, any and all of it. Look at the enemies list of the Democrat Party and the American left, and you'll find it all right there. Everything that I mentioned. So what you're seeing, this is not about bringing people together. It's it's not about having people be permitted to protest using their constitutional rights over police brutality. That's what you're to think this is about. What it's about is making this league look bad. It's about creating an image and an aura in the average American, when watching this game, that it's dangerous and that it's risky and maybe it shouldn't be played. And already you see parents of junior high school students and high school students not letting their kids play football now. You see even some players retiring at age 25 after they see movies and read stories about brain damage and concussions. The 
effort is constant, but the main thing they have done, they've taken the fun and the joy out of the game. They have taken the mystique out of the game, and the league is right in there unwittingly helping them. There's simply no way for a business to grow. The NFL permitting its employees to do what they've been doing since Kaepernick got it started. That's People don't watch the NFL for signs of equality and diversity and fairness and social justice. It's not why people are watching. They watch it to escape all of that. They watch it for the mystique. They watch it for the magic, the athletic abilities of these people to do things that we can't do and watch these people perform victorious rooting for the team, rooting for your fan fantasy football team, but now they've added a guilt to all of this. They have added this idea that you're enjoying this carnage? You're enjoying this barbaric display of cruelty? And more and more people can't escape it once the media begins covering that aspect of it first and foremost you cannot avoid it you you can try even when you watch a game pull that stuff out of your mind you see a hard hit oh 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 is he dead is he gonna die or, or some other thought like this that is not conducive to the business growing So it's not it's not about the flag. It, they want you to think it is. And it's not about police brutality. They want you to think it is. We are in the midst of an all-out assault on the National Football League. Not just the game of football, but the National Football League. In fact, if you look carefully now, you can begin to see stories that I predicted two years were going to happen, which are these. Look who suffers the majority of these injuries. African Americans, 75% of the league. Look who's suffering these injuries. Look who's having and being forced to play this game in order to earn a living, and then look in the owner's box, and who is sitting there? Wealthy white billionaires. The racial component is starting to show now in various stories about this. And you're seeing, I've seen stories comparing the National Football League to modern-day slavery. You've seen it. I've seen it, the racial component. It's all there, folks. Everything the left does, everything history has recounted that they do, and everything we know that they do is contained in the last three to four years of the National Football League. So here we go with the sound bite. Well, the sound bite's coming up in a minute. Headline. National survey. Americans agree with Trump on national anthem. 64% say... NFL players should stand and be respectful. Uh, let's see what was. Uh, majority of adults agree with Trump on firing athletes who kneel during anthem. 64% demand NFL players stand for anthem. 50% less likely to watch over politics. Stores in Pittsburgh that sell Steelers memorabilia are hurting. Steelers fans angry at the team for staying in the locker room Sunday are already not visiting merchandise stores in such numbers that the owners of these little stores have already noticed it. PJ Media, millionaire players and billionaire owners in the NFL who fancy themselves the consciences of America aren't really thinking big picture. There are people who are not fabulously wealthy, who have to deal with alienated fans. This owner, and there's a picture here, of a Pittsburgh sports store, says the problem started Monday morning after the Steelers stayed in the locker room. Fan anger may not last forever, but it's very real at the moment. The league is ignoring it. Oh, they are. The league is ignoring it. 
the owners are ignoring it. That's why the owners are scared to death. They've got to make a choice. Who do they side with? Do they side with the people who are angering the customers? That would be the players protesting. Or do they side with the customer? And they've made their choice. But it's changing. Now the stories are, there's a headline, All Patriots to Stand for Next Game Anthem. And another team, All Players to Stand, Cowboys, will stand. This is backfiring on the NFL. It's backfiring on the protesting players exactly as you and I knew it would. Uh, Let's see. Trump urges NFL to ban players kneeling during anthem. Trump continues to double down. DirecTV is allowing NFL customers, Sunday ticket customers, their refunds. The Green Bay Packers have asked fans attending Thursday night's game to lock arms during the national anthem. We have that on audio soundbite. Aaron Rodgers, audio soundbite number four, yesterday in Green Bay. Aaron Rodgers speaking with reporters. This is about equality. This is about unity and love and growing together as a society. And this week we're going to ask the fans to join in as well and come together and show people that we can be connected and we can grow together. So it's about equality, it's about unity and love and growing together. And, of course, it's very risky to say, no, it isn't. But I take these risks all the time. That's not what this is about. It's what they want you to think it's about. And it's what you want. They want you to think they are achieving and overcoming while, in fact, they are dividing people by doing anything other than standing for the national anthem. Be right back. And we go back to the phones here. Uh, This is Monty in Richland, Washington. Great to have you, Monty. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing good, Rush. I just wanted to tell you I'm a 71-year-old deplorable and I want to say thank you for all that you do for our country. And I have one million percent support for you and for our president. Thank you very much. You don't sound 71 years old out there, Monty. Well, thank you very much. I like to pretend I'm younger, but that's the way it goes. Well, that's the way to do it. That's the exact well, way to do it. If you're not 71 in your mind, then you're not 71 in your heart. Yeah, that's the way it is, to. I've been listening to you for over 25 years, Rush, and I've tried and tried and tried to be able to tell you thank you. And that's all I really have to say today is how much I appreciate you, and I'm so looking forward to you being on Hannity tomorrow night. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Hannity is uh, flying down here tonight after his program. He's bringing in a commie babe makeup artist who uh, was vice president of makeup at Rush Limbaugh, the TV show. She's now a facial arts vice president supervisor at Fox News. And uh, Hannity's bring- and, and my niece, Kristen, is on the Hannity staff. It's a coincidence. And uh, she's coming down with, uh, with the group. It's going to be a... It's- oh, yeah. Old enough to be. Well, she's getting married next summer. Kristen's getting married next summer. You should see the long faces of all the guys at Fox News when they found that out. Uh, That's just, uh, it is. Everybody's, we're getting older. Everybody else is too. Hey, look, folks, on this, if if you doubt me on this NFL bill, let me ask you a question. These players, they really cared about police brutality. Why not just call? You think they couldn't get the national media assembled for a press conference? Do you think they could get somebody on MSNBC or, or, or CNN to give them a whole half hour on TV? Right. So why don't they do that? Why are they doing this stuff to the flag? Why are they doing this stuff? This linking of kneeling. and Why are they doing that before games? Why? To harm the NFL. The players, I don't think, realize what's happening here. I really, But that's what's going on. Having more fun than a human being should be allowed... To have Rush Limbaugh, a man, a legend, a way of life. The saga continues. Now to the audio sound bites. I want you to listen. This is this. All of these bites have something in common. 
Up first is Pete Carroll, coach of the Seattle Seahawks, last night on Anderson Cooper. Question, Coach, do you feel what's really going on here is Trump? Trump said today the protests were disgraceful, uh, saying, I don't think you can disrespect our flag, our country, our national anthem. You that's really what's going on here, Coach. Absolutely not. I don't see it anywhere pointed in that direction. What's happening is players are rallying to protest and set out a, a message that they want to send out. It has nothing to do with against the flag or against the, the country or any of that. It's the opposite. I think they're talking on behalf of uh, freedom of speech and the Constitution and, and having a message that they really want to impart on the rest of the people in the country. I admire Pete Carroll as a coach. Um, he's good at what he does. Players love to play for him, but that's just caca. These guys are not... <laughs> they're not even thinking of the Constitution. Freedom of speech doesn't even apply here. This is workplace. You don't have the right to say and do whatever you want to at work. Let me ask you this. What would happen, do you think, Snurdly? What would happen if during player introductions a player ran out carrying a Confederate flag? Do you think that, hey, freedom of speech, that guy's got every right to say what he... He would be thrown out of the league if, if he got out of the stadium alive. They'd probably have to put him on injured reserve before the game even started for what would happen to the guy. You think there'd be any tolerance for that? Hell no. It's not about that. It isn't about freedom of speech. Remember Kaepernick? This all started, as far as the players are concerned, what they think. It's all about police brutality. Kaepernick laid it out. A country that doesn't treat its people of color fairly and rightly. I don't think I owe that country any respect or allegiance. And that's what everybody's joining. But now when they're being called on, oh, no, 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 we're not dissing the flag. Yes, you are. That's what it looks like. When the flag is flying and the anthem's playing and you take a knee or you sit on the bench, there, you're not going to convince anybody you're thinking about the Constitution when that happens. You are asking for attention. You're asking to be seen. You want to be seen so that when you're asked about it, you can complain about your grievance. And the player's grievance is police brutality and inequality and all that. That's what's got them all revved up, and I wonder why. But you see, that's just the face of it. That's not the objective. What that is doing is exactly what it's supposed to do. It's disgusting people, and it's causing them to tune out the NFL. Because the objective is to harm the NFL as a business. And it's succeeding. For every fan that boycotts, for every fan that cancels a TV subscription, for every fan that doesn't buy memorabilia or tickets, for every fan that doesn't watch the games on Sunday or Monday night, it's working. In the league, I think is a clueless entity in the middle of this, as are the players. What interest? Tell me this. What's in it for the players, for the league, to lose money? What's in it for the players, for the league, to lose television ratings and thus advertising rates? What's in it for the players to lose audience? What's in it for the league for that to happen? And yet, what are they doing? They're behaving in ways that make exactly that happen. It is happening. To even venerable franchises like the Pittsburgh Steelers, who have... Yeah, that's it. The Cowboys may be the most loyal fan base there is, and I don't mean that to offend any of you. Seattle's is loyal, too. Don't, But they're doing it. They're making it happen. And this is a theme. They're all backing away. They're trying to back away from the fact that this is about dissing the flag. Up next is uh, Pam Oliver, CNN's newsroom yesterday afternoon with Brooke Baldwin. Pam Oliver, you've been in the thick of this. You've been talking with players. You just heard the president's words. What are you hearing out there? I've been doing this for 20 years, and I noticed that players were not really distracted, but they were 
a little bit annoyed. They were ticked off. They were angry. Their emotions were all over the place. And I felt it was because of the president's comments. And I felt they felt emboldened. We are taking this whole thing regarding social injustice, not mm -hmm. the flag, not the anthem. A lot of people are sort of missing the point, and really? no one more than the president. So here's another one. Another reporter says, it's not about the flag. It's not about the anthem. Oh, yes, it is, Pam. That is how it started, and that's how it continues. It's all about the flag, and it's all about the anthem, because that's where all of this is happening. And then when asked about it, they said, I'm for social justice, and I'm for the equality. And it's about using disrespect for the flag to call attention to themselves. It's being done on purpose. But note how they're backing away from this. It's not about the flag. Why are they saying that? Because it's hurting. It is not helping. It's not promoting equality. It's not promoting unity. It's causing division. And division in a big, giant business does not lead to business growth. So they are realizing that what they've done and doing is hurting. So they want to keep doing it, but tell you that they're not protesting the flag while they protest the flag. And they want to tell you it's not about the anthem when what they do is when the anthem is being played. Here's another one. NFL Network uh, reporter saying the same thing. And that is one point that I absolutely want to make. At no point ever has any player who knelt or raised a fist or sat said that he was protesting the anthem or that he was protesting the flag. Not one. And I will borrow your phrase. This conversation has been hijacked in some right. way. No, it it's not. Back. Stop the tape. People say I'm, I'm getting short of time here. I don't. Nothing's been hijacked except the game. NFL reporter. This is Aditi Kinkabwala. Aditi Kinkabwala. She's the reporter here. The game is what's been hijacked, Aditi. Not the conversation. They're all backtracking now. It's not about the flag. It's, it's not about protesting the flag. It's not about the anthem. Well, then why is all this happening during the anthem? And why is all this happening when the flag is flying? It is about the flag. As far as the players think, they think it is. They think it's about... Kaepernick said it. I can't support a country. I can't offer allegiance to a country that treats its people of color this way. Everybody signed up for that, glommed onto that. Now that it is hurting, oh, they want to keep doing it. Well, telling you it's not about the flag. Now they want us all to link arms in Green Bay tomorrow night to show our unity. It's just going to cause further division. There are going to be people booing in the stadium when this happens. That's not why they're there. The game is being hijacked. Not the conversation. Want to hear one more? Van Jones, CNN. NFL protests were never about the flag or the anthem, he says Any here. other president in a situation like this would be trying to rally not just the country, but the world to help what's going on in Puerto Rico. Instead, he decides to pick a fight with, you know, unfortunately, African-American athletes. Now they're saying these young men are protesting the flag. These young men are protesting the national anthem. That is not what they are protesting. They are protesting the fact that the neighborhoods they came from, where they go back to every Thanksgiving, where they get text messages from every day, there is real pain and suffering and police misconduct. Okay, this is not a, an act of See, it's not about the flag. It's about the cops in the neighborhood on Thanksgiving or whatever. It is about the flag because that's when it happens. It is about the anthem because that's when it happens. And whatever reason they tell themselves they're doing this, they are choosing to do it at a time everybody pauses with the idea of honoring America. And that's what they are choosing not to participate in. Now, they can tell themselves all day and they can tell us that it ain't about the flag and it ain't about the anthem, but that's when they choose to do it. But the point is, it's not working. It's not creating unity. It's causing division. People, fans are angry, and now everybody's trying to band together and save the day. So they want to keep doing what they're doing because they love the attention. And the left wants them to keep doing it because the left loves the division and they love the chaos. The players want to keep doing it because they get some attention, but they want you to know it's not about the flag. And they don't have anything to anthem. No, oh, no, no, no. But it is.
And what it really is, is about damaging the NFL. Now, I don't think the players want to do that, folks. That's what I'm saying here. There's a lot of dupes in this, including the league and the owners are signing up for all of this. A total misreading and a total misunderstanding of the fan base, the American population, a total misunderstanding and misreading of what these things mean, unity and equality and division. And they think they're hijacked, language of being hijacked, conversations being hijacked. The game has been hijacked, is all that's happened here. The NFL and the drive-by media are trying to rewrite history right before our eyes. It's not about the flag. It's not about the anthem. Well, then stop protesting. Anyway. Let me grab a quick call here and just squeeze it in. Erie, Pennsylvania. Mark, 45 seconds. Go. Hey, hey. how you doing, Rush? Fine, thank you. Listen to you since you started years ago. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now, I wanted to let you know that a couple of years back, you predicted this uh, was going to occur. You said that they were after the NFL and SUVs, and they're going to try to stop them, ban them, whatever. I don't know if you recall that, but I do, and I thought I'd remind you. I appreciate that. I, I do I do recall it, but you know what? It makes my day that you remember it. And I'm not I'm not exaggerating. I'm not it makes my day. Folks, it's a great affirmation to know that people actually hear what you say when you <laughs> when you do one of these programs. It's comforting to know that there are people like you that I can rhyme. Yeah, he heard me say it. People know it. I appreciate that, Mark. Thanks much. Gotta go back right after this, folks. Sit tight, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back before you know it. I just saw where Saudi Arabia is going to lift the restriction on women and allow them to drive. Now, what do you think is behind that? It's not the Now Gang. The Now Gang's not over there protesting them. So what? There has to be a reason that benefits Saudi men or they wouldn't do it.